Good evening, everyone. My name is Anju Paul, and I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology and Public Policy at Yale NUS College, and I'm honored to be the chairperson for tonight's program. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all 352 and counting of you to this evening's event, the launch of the second report from the Singapore Minimum Income Standard Study. This project asks the simple but profound question, how much money do households need to achieve a basic standard of living in Singapore today? In 2019, the project team focused on the needs of older adults aged 55 and above. This year, the study asked the same questions with respect to the needs of single and partnered parents with children from various age brackets. It also updates the budgets previously calculated for older adults. And today, we are very lucky to have with us the study's lead authors, Ng Kok Ho and Chiu Yu Yen, with us to introduce the study and its key findings. Ng Kok Ho is Senior Research Fellow and Head of the Case Study Unit at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, where he also leads the Social Inclusion Project, a research program dedicated to analyzing how public policies shape opportunities for participation. His research is concerned with income security, minimum income standards, housing policy, and homelessness. He led the first nationwide street count of homelessness in Singapore in 2019 and is co-editor of the book, They Told Us to Move, Dakota to Cassia, published by Ethos Books in 2019. Tio Yu Yen is Associate Professor, Provost Chair, and Head of Sociology at the Nanyang Technological University. Her research focuses on poverty and inequality, governance and state society dynamics, gender and class. She is the author of Neoliberal Morality in Singapore, How Family Policies Make State and Society, published by Rutledge in 2011, and a book that many of you I'm sure is, are very familiar with, This is What Inequality Looks Like, also published by Ethos Books in 2018. Our program for this evening will proceed as follows. I will hand over in a minute to Yu Yen and Kok Ho, who will give their presentation on their report, What People Need in Singapore, a Household Budget Study. And then once they finished, we will have a little over half an hour for Q&A. During the presentation and also during the Q&A session, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And I see that people have already started to ask questions. If you're on Facebook and have questions that you want to ask, or you want to upvote other people's questions, please register for the webinar on Zoom. Now, in my capacity as chair, I'm going to select the questions to ask the authors, but I will try to be as broad ranging as possible in my selection of questions. Um, the session is going to be recorded and we will be posting it on YouTube in a few weeks time. Once the Q&A session is over, round about, about five minutes to nine, I will let the authors give their final remarks and then we will end the program. All right, with that, let me hand over to Yu Yen and Kok Ho. Over to you. Thank you so much, Anju. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the launch of our report. We're tremendously, tremendously encouraged that so many of you are interested. It, I think it indicates that there's significant public interest in issues around basic needs and minimum income standards, and more generally, the problems we face uh, with inequality and poverty in Singapore. Thank you very much to the team at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for organizing and hosting this webinar, and to Prof Anju Paul for agreeing to moderate it. This evening, only Kok Ho and I are presenting the work, but this research is a deeply collaborative one uh, by a wonderful team, Neo Yu Wei, Art Malod, Steffi Chok, and Wong Yi Lok. So um, next slide, please, Kok Ho. Thank you. I will introduce the context of our study and describe the methodology briefly before Kok Ho elaborates on key findings as well as policy implications. So our study addresses the question, how much money do people need to achieve a basic standard of living in Singapore today? Two years ago in 2019, we published a re report that focused on basic needs of older person households 
those aged 65 and above, and also people 55 to 64 years old. The present report extends this work to the needs of younger persons, and specifically households of parents and children. We study the needs of single and partnered parents and children across various age groups, two to six, sorry, below two, two to six, seven to 12, 13 to 18, and then 19 to 25 years old. With these two waves of research, we now have a comprehensive view of basic needs across the life course. There is a historical and theoretical context to the methodological approach we take. The foundational premise of our research is that it is possible to define needs in universal terms, and that doing so is a critical step in thinking about the social welfare of a society. And the study of household budgets is related to an extensive field of research on human needs and social inclusion. Its theoretical basis stem from early work on the relative and social notions of deprivation. Deprivation reflects social exclusion, as highlighted in Townsend's definition, that people are in poverty when, quote, their resources are so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that they are, in effect, excluded from ordinary living patterns, customs, and activities. So parallel to conceptual and empirical work on poverty and deprivation, researchers have worked on defining absolute levels of income required for daily living. Such research has directly supported the design of policy interventions. And we cite some examples here and more details of th these are cited in our report. So there are several approaches for understanding needs and estimating family budgets. The first is expert directed. This involves um, subject specialists setting the minimum requirements for things like nutrition, commuting costs, healthcare, and so on. The requirements are price. Um, the expert directed approach becomes especially problematic for social aspects of living that entail a strong element of choice, such as visiting friends or exchanging gifts. The second conventional approach is public surveys. These may seek attitudinal responses about income requirements, or they may gather information about actual expenditures in society. And the drawback here is that actual spending may fall below basic needs among lower income groups. Third, in consensual methods, including the MIS approach that we adopt in our study, focus groups are convened to deliberate the meaning of an adequate standard of living, to draw up lists that are required to achieve this standard, and then to review the final list, of course. This approach allows us to capture lived realities. It allows us to tap on ordinary people's deep understanding of basic needs, it allows us to capture variations in needs over the life course. And because it draws on discussion, negotiation, and consensus building, it arrives at reasonable standards that are reflective of societal norms. So the Center for Research in Social Policy at Loughborough University in the UK has been leading a project to establish the minimum income standard uh, in the UK. They've pioneered this methodology. Uh, they've been doing this work since 2008, and they update that work uh, annually to take into account of price inflation as well as changes in society. They have also extended the MIS approach to calculate the income needs of households with specific requirements related to disability or living in remote rural locations. And similar projects have taken off using the MIS methodology uh, in France, in Ireland, Mexico, Portugal, South Africa, Thailand, and Japan. For the past few years, our team that is studying the Singapore case has also been part of this network. We've opted to use the UK MIS methodology for several reasons. Because the approach has been tested in the UK and elsewhere repeatedly, uh, we know that there's been broad consistency in results over time 
and that it's been very adaptable to diverse cultural contexts. And this attests to the robustness as well as the versatility of this methodology. Um, the consensus uh, building strategy also recognizes that the relational, uh, recognizes the relational and social characteristics of needs and the limitations of experts when it comes to capturing people's lived realities of social inclusion. In particular, because the methodology involves detailed and multiple rounds of discussion among focus group participants, it allows us to construct very specific lists of goods and services. This level of detail and precision is, is rarely attainable by expert consultants. Finally, the misapproach involves open sharing and public dissemination of the work. In the UK, this has generated significant and sustained public interest as well as policy impact. And we hope that our work in Singapore can similarly draw in members of the public and policymakers to important conversations about standards of living, wages, and dignified lives in Singapore today. The report we are releasing today uh, draws on empirical work that we did between 2019 and 2021. I will now outline our research process so that when Kok Ho talks about the findings, you'll have a better sense of uh, how they came about. Okay, so our data collection included four waves of focus group discussions, as well as consultations with experts and pricing. Okay, so you will see the many stages that were involved. Each stage that involves focus group discussions included multiple groups and each was organized to center on a different profile. So for example, at stage two, you will see stage two on the slide, task groups. We had one focus group to talk about the needs of a single parent, one to talk about the needs of a partnered mother, one to talk about the needs of a child between zero and two years old, and so on and so forth. Multiple groups, each one focused on a particular set of needs. Um, each focus group that we did throughout this whole process was made up of a unique group of participants, meaning each participant in our project was involved in only one focus group. Um, there's a lot of detail on each stage of the, of the um, work and we elaborate on each of these in our report and you can access the, the report after tonight's webinar on our website. But for now, I wanted to highlight a few features. First, I wanted to say that in stage one, participants build a definition of a basic standard of living that is then used for all future stages. In stages two, five, and six, particip participants are walked through case studies and hypothetical households in order for them to tell us what would Mr. K or Ms. K or Charles Z need in their living room, in their bedroom, to go out, et cetera, right? In order to meet basic standards of living. This is very detailed down to the type of flooring in a flat, the number of teaspoons in the kitchen and the types of things people would eat and wear, okay? So we asked participants to specify what items are needed, how long they would last, what price point the items should be at, and where they would be purchased. Uh, we also asked them to give us rationales of why certain things are needs. Okay. For certain parts of the budget, um, healthcare and food specifically, we consulted experts to make sure that the listed items also meet recommendations for nutritional needs or health healthcare needs for the particular age groups. From the list that participants came up with, and from these checks about nutrition and health, we then looked for and priced the items in real shops. So all items that are included in the budget are based on real prices of real things, okay? And each item on the final list resulted from a process of checks and consensus through these multiple waves of focus group discussions. In other words, all the items that are included in our final budget are those that people have been able to agree are needs for meeting the basic standards of living. 
Um, in addition to these fo focus groups I've described, we also conducted a few special discussions to talk about space and housing needs, and also to gauge how the pandemic may have affected how people think about basic needs. And we can talk about that later if people are interested. Now, um, let me show you then the definition that our respondents uh, came up with yeah, of, of a basic standard of living. We adopted the same definition of a basic standard of living from our 2019 study on elderly household budgets. Uh, and in order to ensure the robustness of the definition, in this more recent round of research, we also conducted a series of orientation groups in that first stage where participants focus on discussing just the definition. So here's the definition, which I think is worth uh, reading out loud. A basic standard of living in Singapore is about, but more than just, housing, food, and clothing. It is about having opportunities to education, employment, and work-life balance, as well as access to healthcare. It enables a sense of belonging, respect, security, and independence. It also includes choices to participate in social activities and the freedom to engage in one's cultural and religious practices. So this definition serves as an anchor point in all subsequent rounds of focus group discussions. As participants discuss the very concrete objects and budgets, for example, plates, spoons, budgets for buying birthday gifts, uh, this definition anchors what needs those items fulfill. Okay. Uh, as mentioned, we use case studies to, um, to shape the discussions. On the left, you will see the profiles we focus on this study, and Koho will say more about this later. On the right of the slide, you will see, you will, you will see the kinds of wording that we use, uh, and the kinds of setup that we use in order to, to um, set up the case studies. Okay. Um, okay. So for today, and, and again, Kok Ho will elaborate on this, um, we, the, the item list that we draw up, as you may have gathered by now, are for individuals rather than households. So the last stage of the research process is to create budgets for different household configurations by combining these individual item lists and uh, combining them into households. And this approach allows us to construct budgets for various configurations of households with single, single or partnered parents and one to three children up to 25 years old. To allow detailed analysis, the report and our presentation today focuses on budgets for two particular household types, which are here highlighted in yellow. Single parent with a child aged two to six years old and partnered parents with two children aged 7 to 12 and 13 through 18. Okay. Okay. A total of 196 participants took part in 24 focus groups with an average of eight persons in each group. We ensured diversity in terms of gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. Uh, it's important to emphasize that the MIS approach generates a budget that broadly reflects what people can reasonably agree are basic needs in Singapore for everyone, okay, for everyone in Singapore today. So it's very important to have socioeconomic diversity to avoid final budgets that are either extravagant or uh, inadequate. Okay. Uh, I will now let uh, Kok Ho take over to present the findings. Thanks, Yuyen. Um, I will talk about the findings from this year's uh, Minimum Income Standards Report. Um, just a word of warning, uh, we are going to get into the nitty gritties. So thank you everyone in advance for your attention. Um, and if there are parts which uh, are not clear and you have questions about, uh, we'll be happy to, to discuss during the Q&A. Right. So first, the key findings, how much do households need, right? working age households with children? Again, to reiterate, um, we start by building individual profiles and item lists, and then using those seven profiles, five of children in different age groups and two of single and then partner parents, we were able to put them into various configurations. Right? In the study itself, uh, we focus on seven different configurations, 
uh, which means we have uh, comprehensive item lists for each of the seven household configurations, uh, which will be released on our study website. But for the purposes of detailed analysis in the report, as well as in uh, this evening's presentation, we focus on those two types of household. Uh, and I should also mention that apart from the seven um, household configurations you see on this slide, um, uh, our study website will also provide an online budget calculator, uh, which you can use to, to generate the budgets for any uh, other configuration of households involving single or partner parents with one to three children uh, in any of these age groups. Right? So we, we do welcome um, you to visit the, the website later on. So here are the numbers. What do households need to meet, meet the basic standard of uh, living in Singapore? If we focus on a single parent with one child aged two to six, uh, every month, they'll need $3,218. Partnered parents with two children aged 7 to 12 and 13 to 18 will need $6,246. Right? Um, and uh, this, this time around, we also updated the budgets uh, that we first calculated in the 2019 study for the single elderly person. That figure uh, we updated using uh, price inflation. Um, based on the CPI in 2020, and the updated figure is $1,421. Right. So how do these budgets uh, stand in relation to uh, population income standards? We can compare them to the national median monthly work income of full-time workers in 2020. That's the most current data that's available. In 2020, the middle earner uh, in Singapore, full-time workers, uh, earn $4,534 a month. So the single parent's uh, monthly budget, MIS budget, uh, is about 0 0.7 times of, of this median. Uh, for two parents with uh, two children, right, the four-person household, their budget is about 1.4 times the median. Uh, in other words, uh, the single parent with one child to meet a basic standard of living in Singapore today will need about 70% of what the middle earner needs, right? whereas a four-person household will need uh, 1.4 times of what the middle earner uh, makes. So these are the detailed numbers. Uh, don't worry about kind of reading and, and registering all of them. Um, I just put this slide up to show what are the main areas uh, in the budget. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be releasing detailed spreadsheets um, of every item right, um, that goes into the budget for the seven household types. There are 500 odd items for each household. So across the seven types, we have several thousand items. I, I didn't want to put that on the slide. Uh, so these are, these are aggregations right, by, by categories of items. Um, and so generally speaking, these are the main categories. Uh, the budget goes towards food, clothing, transport, uh, housing, right? purchase of housing, household items, uh, healthcare, social participation, uh, meaning leisure, family activities, cultural uh, festivals, and so on. Uh, education, of course, the children's education, uh, personal care items, uh, insurance, and childcare. Generally speaking, regardless of the household configuration, the biggest components, right, the most expensive parts of the budget uh, are usually housing, food, and education. I also want to draw your attention to the bottom two rows uh, of, the, of the slide, of this table. Um, public services uh, like housing, healthcare, education, and childcare form a significant proportion of the budgets. Right? So one way to think about this is the greater the role of the state in providing and financing these services, the lighter the burden on individual households. As things currently stand, uh, these services amount to quite a huge proportion of both of these budgets, right? For the single and partner parent households, they amount to about 30% uh, of the partner parent's household budget and about 40% of the single parent's uh, household budget. Uh, so that's a huge proportion. I just wanted to flag that. If we took out those four elements, the, the monthly budgets fall to below 2,000 for the single parent family around 4,006 for the partner parent household. So a lot does go towards uh, individual households paying for these basic public services. I wanted to flag especially housing because it is uh, one of the largest components 
of uh, this household budgets. How do we go about uh, calculating the cost of housing? We began first by um, clarifying assumptions about flat sizes. Um, as Yuyan mentioned, we conducted special focus groups with participants just to talk about housing and space needs. Uh, so they came up with a set of rules that they agree on, right? which say that um, up to two children may share a bedroom, uh, and only if they are the same sex once they re reach puberty. Right? So um, if it's uh, a one-child family, then a three-room HDB flat will be sufficient. But uh, if it's a two children family, then it depends on their sex. Right? If they're both boys or both girls, uh, then they could fit into a three room flat. Right? Uh, but if it's one boy and one girl, then you will need a four room flat right? with three bedrooms, one for the parents, uh, one for the boy and one for the girl. And of course, because each bedroom can only take two kids, once there are three children, you will need a four room flat. So these are our base assumptions, three or four room HDB flats. We also wanted to flag this, which is when costing for housing, we need to do this within the context right, and parameters of current housing policies, because that's the most realistic way to cost for housing. And current public housing policies in Singapore do this. right? Uh, they do discriminate between different types of households based on partnership history. Right? Not just marital status, but partnership history, meaning the policies differentiate between widowed or divorced parents on the one hand um, versus single parents who have never married, right? Uh, and there are huge differences in, in their access to housing, right? Whereas married couples and widowed or divorced uh, single parents are able to buy a HDB flat from 21 years old and have access to the full range of new and resale flat types, single parents who have never married have to wait 14 years longer. They're only allowed to buy a HDB flat from the age of 35. If they wanted to buy a new flat, it is only two room flats in non-mature estates. Otherwise, they have to buy a resale flat, right? So this means that um, partnership uh, history um, will determine the housing trajectory of different uh, parents and, and therefore their households, right? So based on this uh, housing policies, we constructed uh, three different housing trajectories. For partnered parents, the assumption is that they will purchase a new flat at 26 years old because our oldest uh, age category for the children is 19 to 25. So adulthood in our study starts at 26. So partnered parents purchase a flat at 26 years old, uh, as do single parents who are widowed or divorced. Um, but for single parents who are never married because they are not eligible to buy a flat, Right, at 26 years old, we assume that they rent a flat from the open market for the period when they are 26 to 34 years old. And then the moment they can, right, we assume that they will then purchase a flat. But because the space needs uh, is that they will need a three or four room flat, um, and that's not available to buy as a BTO flat, uh, they will have to buy a resale flat when they do buy a flat at 35 years old. So these are the different housing trajectories and when we ran the housing costs uh, on the HDB's housing payment calculator, uh, holding constant the type of housing, the type of flat right, that these families buy, there is a huge cost difference. Right? We have always known, right, and, and researchers uh, have flagged this before, uh, the discrimination against single parents who have never married. But now we are able to measure how much that costs. Right. Uh, the financial cost of this policy discrimination is huge. If you look at the, the third column is in this table, um, simply because of their partnership history, single parents who have never married will pay about $2,500 for housing, about double of the other parents. As a proportion of their total household budgets, it is also significantly more, right? 37% versus 20 odd percent. And this constitutes a huge part of their total budget. So those are the key findings. And once we have uh, the income amounts, uh, we can use them as a benchmark for further analysis. Right? So in the slides to follow, I'll be showing you uh, graphs, right? quite a few of them. Um, and we'll do this in, in a few stages. I will first compare the MIS budgets to work incomes. And I will break down the work incomes by decile groups, age groups, and, and other dimensions. And then I'll move on to look at uh, how the MIS budgets compare 
to public schemes. And here we focus on four types of public schemes, wage interventions, transfers and subsidies for children, retirement income protection for older people, and then finally, cash transfers for low-income households. So we'll focus on those four types of policies. And then finally, uh, we will wrap up by discussing a possible living wage right, that households need. So let's go. Um, this is the first comparison. This graph looks at the distribution of uh, monthly household work income uh, per household member, right? So the bars in this graph uh, show the average household income per household member for the lowest 10% and then the next 10% and so on until the highest, the top 10%. So these are called decile groups, right? And then we compare it to the MIS budgets, right? And this line uh, represents both the single and partnered parent households. Why is there only one line? That's because we are looking at uh, work income per household member. So we also must look at MIS budget per household member. Right? And once we divide the single uh, parent a single parent's household budget by two, which is the household size. And then we divide the partner parent with two children's uh, household budget by four. Uh, it turns out to be about the same. It's around 1,006, right? So, so there is one line. So what this graph tells us is that um, the MIS budgets are very, very close to the average household work income of the third decile group, meaning that the, about 30% of working households every month earn less than the MIS budgets required for a basic standard of living uh, in those two types of household. 30% is a significant proportion. Next, we look at earnings uh, based on age group. Right? The bars in this graph are slightly different than the ones uh, in the previous graph. Uh, these are based on individual workers. So this is median monthly work income of full-time employed residents. So these are uh, individual earnings. And since we're looking at individual earnings, we took the MIS budgets and divided it by the num number of adult earners. So for the single, uh, single, parent, uh, single parent's budget, there is only one earner, right? We assume all adults are, are working. So it's about 3,002. Uh, in the partner parents household scenario, we assume both parents are working. So we divide their household budget by two, right? So again, it works out to be about the same for the single and partner parent households, about 3,200. So again, there's one line. Um, and what this comparison shows is that uh, workers in the youngest and oldest age groups uh, do not earn um, the amount that is needed to meet basic needs uh, in those two types of household. Right? They fall below, and those are the orange bars. We can also look at earnings across a range of other dimensions. Uh, in this slide, we look at different types of occupation and then different types of work. And finally, different educational levels, right? So here, again, we are looking at the monthly work incomes, uh, individual earnings, right, of, uh, of full-time workers in Singapore. If we compare the different occupational groups, here you see a huge inequality, right? For the lowest paid occupational groups, cleaners, laborers, and related workers, as well as service and sales workers, they fall significantly below the MIS budgets for the single and partnered parent households. Whereas if you look at the top earning occupational category, managers and administrators, they earn several times more right, than the MIS budgets. So here, uh, we are reminded that not only are some occupational categories are likely to be struggling, there is also huge inequality, wage inequality within our labor market. Uh, the picture is similar once we look at different types of work, casual and on-call workers do not make enough to meet a basic standard of living, but fixed term contract and permanent workers do. If we look at educational levels, um, workers with less than diploma education will fall below what they need, uh, those two households need for a basic standard of living, uh, whereas diploma and degree holders uh, will exceed what they need. We can also look at uh, pay differences uh, by gender. Uh, we have always known that there is a gender gap in Singapore. And this gap exists regardless of occupational group or educational uh, level, right? Women are consistently paid less, even within the same occupations, um, with the same educational levels. Um, we then compare it to the MIS budgets. 
Um, and what this graph shows you um, is that the inequalities across different occupational groups and across different educational groups are so huge uh, that those inequalities play a much bigger role right, in determining whether households reach that black line than gender does. Right? But nonetheless, uh, this graph is a reminder uh, that much more needs to be done in terms of closing the gender pay gap uh, because this has huge implications for women, uh, both meeting their immediate needs as well as their income security in retirement. Now we can look at uh, how the MIS budgets compare with various uh, public schemes. Right? And the first public schemes I'll look at is wage interventions. In Singapore, the primary uh, wage interventions to protect wages at the low end of the distribution are the progressive wage model, uh, which at this point still only applies to three sectors, cleaning, security, and landscape. Although there have been uh, welcome announcements just very recently to say that this will be extended in, in the coming years. Um, and on top of the progressive wage model, there has also been for some years now, uh, a workfare income supplement. So whereas the progressive wage model is a sector-based minimum wage with a wage progression ladder that employers are required to pay, the workfare income supplement is a wage supplement that the government pays. Right? So, so that's a key difference. Um, in in making this, uh, doing these calculations, uh, we took into account uh, employer CPF contribution on top of PWM wages. So that goes in. And WIS has uh, two components. It pays out uh, in a 40-60% ratio uh, of cash and CPF. Right? We include both of those components. Right? So both the cash and CPF components of WIS are, are incorporated. And once we add all, the, all of those things up, PWM plus employers, CPF contributions, WIS, both of the cash and CPF components, uh, those are the monthly amounts that you see in the second column. We can then compare them to the MIS budgets again for the single and partnered parent households, as well as for the single elderly person. Right? Uh, the picture is very clear. Current wage protection measures are just about adequate for single elderly persons with a much lower MIS budget. But if the single parent household or the partnered parent household were to depend on low wage work, they will only achieve around half to 60% of what they need for a basic standard of living. And, and that is with the wage interventions. So clearly, uh, the interventions that are currently available are not adequate for working age households with children. Then we move on to look at interventions for children. And here there are two key ones. Uh, one is the baby bonus cash gift. Uh, which is worth $8,000 uh, paid out as a lump sum upon uh, birth. And then there is a baby bonus, a first step grant, which goes into a child development account. Uh, but this account uh, can be used to pay for things like kindergarten, childcare fees, and so on. Uh, so it's also fair to include it in our comparisons. Because the baby bonus is meant to help defray the cost of raising children, we divided this lump sums over 12 years, right? which is by the time the, the kid finishes uh, primary school. In the case of the CDA, that's when the account closes. So, so 12 years is a reasonable time frame over which to spread uh, this cash transfers. Um, and I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the CDA, the, the cash gift of $8,000 uh, appears to be quite a substantial lump sum, but once you spread it over 12 years um, and then uh, over months, Right. It accounts for less than 2%, less than 2% of uh, what the single and partnered parent households need for a basic standard of living. Uh, the CDA is, of course, uh, worth even less. It, it's less than 1% of this household's monthly income needs. Uh, so really, they, they are negligible right? uh, in the context of the, the practical needs of households raising children. Um, there are a range of subsidies uh, to defray the cost of uh, care for children across ages. Uh, there are subsidies for infant care, child care, student care, uh, and then MOE provides a financial assistance scheme uh, for children in, in school. And then at the university age, there is also a higher education bursary. Right? Um, and in this table, 
uh, we look at two things. Of course, again, we look at the amount of subsidy given, right? but we also look at the income limits. Why? Because these are all schemes with a means-tested component, right? Uh, meaning there is the whole subsidy or part of the subsidy uh, has an eligibility requirement uh, that depends on how much income the household uh, currently has. In general, households with less uh, will get more subsidy. This income limit is important to analyze uh, because when it falls below the MIS budget, when the income limit to qualify for support falls below the MIS budget, it means that actually uh, families need to sacrifice some of their basic needs before they may even be considered for support. Right. So th that is a measure of when support kicks in, which is different from the generosity of support. So, so we look at both of those things. Um, the overall picture is this, uh, that as the child grows up, uh, the income limits tighten, meaning it becomes stricter and more difficult to qualify for support. Generosity also falls. So it becomes harder to qualify for support and you get less when you do qualify. So for example, if you look at childcare subsidies, uh, the income limit is quite generous, meaning even households earning uh, 3.7 times the minimum uh, income standard, uh, they will qualify for some subsidy. And of course, if you earn less, you get more. Right? Uh, but if you look at the MOE financial assistance scheme, uh, only households that get about 74% of the minimum income standard will begin to qualify, which means families are already cut cutting back and missing out on some of their basic needs before the assistance even arrives. Right? And when it does, look at the generosity, right? the MOE financial assistance scheme. And for this, we also took into account the in-kind assistance, value of textbooks, uniforms, and so on. All that adds up to about 6% of what households need compared to um, the subsidies, which go up to as high as 36% for infant care. So that's the overall picture, right? Uh, less assistance, less support, and also stricter limits uh, for older children. Next, switching modes to look at uh, retirees right, at the other end of our life course. Uh, on this slide, I won't spend too much time because these are findings uh, that we, we already um, were, that were already reported in the first MIS study, uh, but because we updated the budgets based on inflation, price inflation, uh, we also redid this analysis. And of course, we, we arrive at the same conclusion, which is that the CPF basic retirement sum uh, only delivers about half to 60% of what single elderly people need. Um, and that's not all, because uh, that's a theoretical amount. In actual fact, uh, in 2020, only about two thirds of active CPF members turning 55 reach the basic re retirement sum, which means that many, many older people do not even get this amount. How much do they get? In recent years, uh, uh, retirees, so 65 and above, get uh, no more than $450 a month, right? And the older ones get even less. So even this theoretical amount uh, is an overestimate. Uh, there are also other interventions uh, for lower income older people, uh, Comcare long-term assistance and silver support scheme. Again, uh, we reiterate the findings from the previous report. Uh, which is that the, the income limits uh, are fairly generous. If you look at the silver support scheme, the income limit is 1,008, uh, which is more than the minimum uh, income standard, which means that the aid uh, kicks in quite early, but the amount is extremely ungenerous. Right? It's 10 to, to 20% of uh, what elderly people need. Um, Comcare long-term assistance is more generous. It reaches 40% of what uh, households need, uh, elderly, single elderly households need, um, but it's extremely difficult to qualify for. Less than 1%, less than 1% of elderly people actually qualify, uh, actually receive help under the scheme. So in general, that, is the, that, is, that has been the strategy. The more generous schemes are harder to qualify for in our current welfare system. And then for low-income households in general, not just older people, uh, there are two main schemes. One is GST voucher cash, right? Uh, and then Comcare short to medium term assistance, SMTA. Again, uh, I look at generosity and income limits. Um, here, uh, the conclusion is that these cash transfer schemes uh, in, in, in relation to what those households actually need right, every month, uh, will, will not make a significant impact. If you look at GST voucher cash, 
um, the single and partner parent households need to fall below right, uh, the MIS budgets, right, 70% of the MIS budget before they will qualify for GST voucher cash. And even when they do, the amount of assistance is just $25 a month. Right? Again, less than 1%. In practical terms, uh, this is more policy gesture right, than, than, than income intervention. It really does not make a, 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 a practical difference to to the lives of these households. Comcare, short to medium term assistance, the median amount uh, that households receive in 2021, as reported in 2021, is $500. Again, just 16% of what single parent households need, 8% of what parent, partner parent households need. Uh, so not enough, right? It's the overall picture. Um, people need to fall below their basic uh, income needs before they qualify. And even when they do, uh, the amount of help um, is not enough. So I've been showing you how those schemes look like in relation to MIS uh, in terms of individual schemes. So in this slide, we bring everything together. Right? We begin by looking at uh, different wage points. Uh, we took away taxes. We added all the transfers. If those households qualify based on their wage level or the transfers that we've been talking about so far, and then we look at their final income position in relation to the MS budget. So that's what the various roles are, are doing. So in the first role, uh, we wanted to look at what the median earner uh, starts with. And then, of course, all the PWM wage levels. We took away taxes. We added all the transfers that they qualify for. And then we look at their final income position. Uh, and the picture is quite consistent. The median earner does fairly well right? in Singapore. Um, they earn, uh, after all taxes and transfers are taken into account, 56% more than the uh, MIS budget uh, for a single parent. Uh, but in all the PWM wage scenarios, people will fall below, even after incorporating all the transfers that I've shown you. Right? Uh, they fall below by anywhere between 5 to 15%. This is for single parents. Then we do the same for partnered parents. Again, uh, it's the same situation. Right, uh, the median earner. So, if both parents are working and both of, both of them are median earners, uh, they will do better than the MIS budget by forty two percent. But if both parents were working PWM jobs, uh, they will fall significantly short. They fare even poorer than the single parents do. Right, they fall below what they need uh, by up to thirty eight percent. So, um, the overall picture from the last two slides is this, right? that the wage um, uh, and social support regime uh, together currently uh, do not help lower wage workers uh, achieve the income that they need for a basic standard of living. Finally, we talk about a living wage. Right? So if current interventions are not enough, um, what can we do? Right? Uh, if we hold public policies constant, so of course, if public policies became more generous, uh, then the picture changes. Right? But if we were not willing uh, to budge on public policies, then, then we must look at wages, right? uh, because the money must come from somewhere. Uh, and here we, we talk about a living wage. Uh, when we talk about a living wage, what do we mean? Right? This idea of a living wage um, we, is defined as um, a wage that allows people to lead a decent standard of living in a particular society uh, at a point in time, right? So that is what it means. So this idea that people should be paid enough to lead a decent standard of living, it has a very long history and a very intuitive social appeal, right? It makes sense that people need to be paid decently, right? Um, and, and this is often uh, differentiated from a legal minimum wage, which tends to be lower, right? Because uh, whereas a legal minimum wage tends to be on the side of, uh, of, the, of being conservative uh, because of possible, uh, because of concerns about possible impact on employment levels, a living wage focuses solely uh, on the cost of meeting basic needs, right? So, so that's, that's where it's different. So in countries that have both a legal minimum wage and a living wage, the living wage tends to be higher and tends to be voluntary, right? Um, we think that this now is an apt moment to consider what a decent and adequate wage for workers in Singapore might look like. Why is it a good opportunity? Uh, because just a few weeks ago, we heard announcements that the, PW, the PWM will be extended to more sectors and occupations soon. 
and there have even been uh, public suggestions to consider a minimum wage alongside the PWM. So this is a good time uh, to talk about a living wage, and we are not doing this in a vacuum. Right? Uh, this idea has taken off in a number of other countries. Uh, here, the UK example is particularly useful. Um, in the UK, uh, there has been a living wage campaign since uh, 2016. They make use of the UK edition of the minimum income standards uh, research uh, to determine the cost of living. And because different household types have different MIS budgets, right? Just as I've been showing you two budgets for single and partner parents, different types of households have different MIS budgets. What they do in the UK is that they take a weighted average of the MIS budgets for different types of household that reflects the actual representation or proportions of these household types within the population. Right? So more common household types will have their MIS budgets kind of weigh more heavily in the final average, right? so to speak. And since 2016, they have been using the MIS research to set the living wage in the UK in that way. It is a voluntary campaign, but more than 7,000 businesses, including local governments, have signed up. And currently, uh, the living wage in the UK covers a quarter million employees providing a rate of wage that is higher than the legal uh, minimum wage in the UK. In Singapore too, we now have uh, what we need, all the information we need uh, to calculate a possible living wage. Similarly, we can begin by uh, using the MIS budgets, uh, the Singapore's MIS budgets, as a measure of how much households need. Right. Unfortunately, because in Singapore, uh, micro data on the distribution of household types is not publicly available, unlike in the UK, so we were not able to calculate a weighted average right, um, of an MIS budget. Uh, but, but that's not a huge problem uh, because in, in places like uh, Ireland, as well as New Zealand, um, the living wage has been calculated using uh, just selected household types. So we can take this approach as well. Uh, we decided to focus on households with two adults and two children, and uh, where the two children are in contiguous age categories uh, to look at uh, how much households need. Right? Uh, and this number of two children is not arbitrary. Two is uh, a typical uh, the typical number of children that Singapore households have. Uh, and of course, two is an important policy number in terms of uh, population replacement. So this is a reasonable, I think, an important household type to use. And we assume that both parents are working full time. Right? If we do not assume this, then the working person will have to assume a larger wage responsibility and then the living wage goes up. Huh? So we assume that both parents are working full time and then we adjust for the same range of taxes and benefits that I've shown you. And this is what it looks like. In the first row, we begin with the MIS budgets for these various household types, as I mentioned, two adults, two children, and then the two children are in uh, adjacent age categories, right? So in the, in the second column, you see the two kids are two and two to six, and the next column, two to six, seven to 12, next column, seven to 12, 13 to 18, and finally, there is a 13 to 18 and 19 to 25 we have separated out the household with the, the, the oldest children uh, because university fees, uh, they do skew the total budget up, right? Um, and in the focus groups, uh, this is something we can talk about later if people are interested. Uh, people were very consistent. Uh, there was easy consensus that a university education today in Singapore is a basic need, right? Um, there, was, there was no contention over this, right? Um, so because there is a, that, that it skews upwards, we decided not to take it into account in calculating an average. So focusing on the other three MIS budgets uh, and taking an average of how much work income they need. Uh, per working parent, a possible living wage in Singapore today is $2,906, right? So for uh, parents in this type of households, typical household, each of them has to earn $2,906 per month in order for their families to, to meet basic needs. Um, this includes employer CPF contributions, right? So if we took out the 17% employer CPF contribution, the gross uh, monthly wage is, is just, just below $2,500. Uh, we think this is a reasonable uh, target to aim for, uh, in, because again, uh, in 2020, the median income, the middle earner right, in Singapore's uh, economy already earns 56% more than our target of 2,906. But unfortunately, PWM wage levels fall significantly below this target. Uh, they are not enough. 
So where does that leave us? I'll wrap up by focusing on kind of the key policy lessons we can draw right, from this series of analysis. In terms of work income and wage interventions, uh, using the household budgets as income benchmarks uh, allows us to identify groups which are not uh, which, which are at risk of not meeting their basic needs. And we high, highlighted some of this, right? Different age groups, um, educational levels, types of work, and, and so on, right? And the overall picture is this. Existing wage interventions are not enough, right? To ensure adequate incomes across the entire labor force. Um, in particular, parents with children who are working in low-wage sectors uh, are likely to struggle. We also saw, again, uh, a persistent gender inequality in pay, uh, which will affect women's financial independence and freedom. Right? We calculated a possible living wage. We proposed $2,906 uh, as a target amount to, for us to begin discussions about. Right? Um, and current PWM wages fall significantly short of this number. And I think the key... Uh, the, the key takeaway uh, from these comparisons is this. Right? If work participation continues to be a key element of Singapore's social contract, which we institutionalize through policies like the CPF, um, and also make as a condition of receiving social assistance and as a way of differentiating subsidies like for childcare, then which intervention must go much further than PWM currently does. If we insist on work, but do not ensure that works, uh, work pays adequately, uh, then families will find themselves in a corner. In terms of housing, uh, the main takeaway is this. Uh, the policy discrimination against single, single parents who are never married is very concerning. It increases the financial strain on these households that already normally have lower earning capacity because there is only one that out. Um, and it means that in practice, they may be uh, if they were to meet the housing needs, they are likely to only be able to do so at the expense of other basic needs, or they may be cutting back some of their other needs. Right? It raises serious questions about the fair use of public resources, right? in addition to, to housing insecurity. For children's needs, uh, we notice that parents' financial pressures are likely to become heavier as their children grow older, um, mainly because the current regime of support tapers off for older children. In all our focus groups, parents express concern and awareness uh, of the amount of uh, and the weight of financial demand that parents face. They were also very aware that different families have very unequal capacities to meet these needs. In terms of income support, uh, there are issues with both uh, eligibility and adequacy, so both eligibility and generosity. This means that families are likely to have to sacrifice some of their basic needs before they may even be considered for assistance. And even after qualifying, they are, they are not likely to be able to meet their basic needs because of the low generosity. For older people, we reiterate the findings from the previous study. Uh, older people who continue to work will earn just about enough to manage. Those who are depending on CPF may find themselves a little bit short. Those depending on public assistance will fall a long way below what they need. So on the whole, uh, there is at this point still no dependable and adequate income protection system for the most economically insecure households in Singapore. Right. Uh, I will stop here and I, I look forward to, to questions from the audience. Thank you, for, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kok Ho um, uh, and Yu Yen for your detailed and thought-provoking presentation on your findings and for all the research that went into this report in the first place. Um, the questions are coming in fast and furious and I'd like to urge all of the audience members to type in your questions or upvote your favorite questions um, into the Q&A feature. And the questions that we have so far are very wide ranging and they demonstrate people's intense curiosity about the report's findings. Um, I've been impressed by the, the range in questions um, from very policy focused questions to really granular questions about your design and methodology. Um, I'm gonna take the prerogative as chairperson to ask the first question, however, um, and I'm gonna ask um, a, a question that hasn't been asked actually, which is quite surprising. So between the publication of your 2019 report, which focused on the needs of the elderly in Singapore and your, your, your 2021 report, a lot has changed in the world and in Singapore. The biggest difference of course is COVID. So could you share with all of us 
how you see the impact of COVID both on your current report's findings about single and, and partnered parents and also the needs of the elderly. And more broadly, how has COVID changed the economic and social landscape in Singapore and perhaps even the social contract? At the same time, has COVID simply brought to light issues that actually predate the pandemic? Over to both of you. Do I get the prerogative of arrowing one of you? No, that was me nodding at you, Yen, to say you go. <laughs> okay, okay, give you a give you a rest. Um, I maybe I will say something about methodologically how we responded to the circumstances since we were doing this right in the in the in the middle of things, and then maybe Koko wants to say a little bit about the other part of the question. Um, the research was happening uh, while the research was happening. We were very much interrupted by. Um, the pandemic and the circuit breaker. So we had to suspend groups. And during that time, we were, we, we were wondering, you know, has, have people's ideas about basic needs changed? And so we convened some special groups over Zoom um, in order to find out during that circuit breaker period, in order to talk, talk to people generally about kind of how, have, how they think about basic needs, how things have affected them, et cetera. And I guess our biggest takeaway was that um, many things that were existing basic needs became more salient. So it wasn't exactly that the needs themselves change, but certain things became more salient and certain things maybe became less so. So for example, because we were in circuit breaker and there was this sudden move towards home-based learning, devices became absolutely a basic need. Right, And so uh, parents talked a lot about how every child needs to have a certain kind of, have, has to have their own device because they need it to continue attending school. They need internet connection at home. Uh, space constraints became a very uh, problematic thing for, for many people in, in homes, right? Having enough space for uh, two working parents in some cases, as well as uh, several children in different age groups. Um, so that that also became more salient. I, I, would, I would say the need is, is quite consistent, but they became more salient. Um, things like travel became um, things that people know they would still like to do and th that they still see as important needs, but they also knew that was suspended indefinitely. Right, uh, so that that became less of a thing that came up during conversations. Um, a, apart from this, uh, we also looked at prices. Uh, we also kept track of prices over several months because there was so much news about, particularly about food shortages. So we looked particularly at food prices and food delivery prices. And although there was some fluctuation in some items. Um, by the end of last year, most things had more or less stabilized. So for an, I think for the, for the sh I suppose we're still in the short term, I don't know. Are, are we in the short term? Are we in the medium term? I, like it's hard to say how much longer this is going to persist, but at least in this range of time that we're, we're in, um, we were able to confidently say that the prices we settled at you know, for the food uh, uh, prices that we are, we are comfortable, are relatively stable and would allow people to meet basic standards of living. Koho, did you want to answer the more uh, sort of- Yeah, there was, a, <laughs> there was a very interesting second part of the question as well, right? Which is about whether we, we think the social contract has changed and, and so on. Um, I think the first thing to say is that there's so much uncertainty bound up with this, right? I think the uncertainty for everyone. I mean, prediction is always a risky business for, for researchers. But I think even for policymakers, there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, people are trying to read whether the current changes in the labor market and economy are transient or permanent. I mean, if I were to ask whether the, the business of tourism has changed kind of permanently, how, how do we answer that, right? Um, or or has, has working patterns changed, right? Will we still need 
concrete offices right after this i mean who knows and and who is to say so there is a lot of un un uncertainty bound around this um why do i mention this it's because uh, i think it provides an opportunity uh, for us to to because there's so much uncertainty people are also wondering whether this is a window of opportunity to to rethink our social contract and social welfare system right uh, are we already beginning to do this uh I would say maybe, right? So why do I say that? Uh, there are small steps. Uh, the PWM announcements recently are very welcome, although it must also be said that they are late and not enough, right? I mean, we, we don't want to be the person when there is positive news to, to say it's late and not enough, but, but it is late and not enough, right? PWM was first introduced in, in 2012, nine years ago, a whole nine years ago. And since then, there have been many calls to extend it to more sectors than the three. And if that had been done prior to COVID, uh, how much protection would that have offered lower income workers in, in other sectors uh, in terms of the income buffers they could have built up prior to this pandemic? It could really have helped to save some, some households' uh, livelihoods, I, I think. But nonetheless, it is now done, right? Um, and, and therefore, we, we say we focus on the future. And for the future, I, I think a target is important, which is why we say that we, I, I, and I think it, on this policymakers are in agreement, uh, they are extending the PWM to more sectors, but they have also announced the intention to close and narrow the gap between lower wage workers and, and the median. Uh, so the overall policy thinking, I think, is, is very consistent right, across people in, in this space, which is that uh, recent changes are very welcome. Uh, we need to do more and hopefully quicker than we have done uh, so far. Thank you both um, for that really expansive answer. I'm now gonna to turn to the most popular question in the, the Q&A box, which has to do still with policy. Um, and this comes from Lito Tio, who has asked um, uh, to, to both of you, but uh, primarily to a, 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 a quote that um, Coco had, had uh, mentioned earlier, which was that, the more the state helps with supporting the cost of the three biggest areas of spending, the lesser the burden on the family. And so the question was, what changes or recommendations to existing policies would the research team propose to help the state take on this load? Um, and, and there's an interesting kind of underlying question here about the relative balance between state assistance versus pu pushing for a higher minimum, for a minimum wage, or a, a living wage? And how do you balance between these two different policy directions? Hmm. This is an income mix question, an right? income mix question, uh, which as Anju uh, has, has pointed out, is about the, the relative roles right, of the state, the market, uh, and the individual, right? including informal resources. It is a question that the MIS on its own uh, is not positioned to answer. Right. The MIS on its own doesn't say where the money should or must come from, um, but the MIS is, uh, is, is, a, is a scientific and an objective benchmark of what households actually need. And once we know, uh, we can apply it to in our thinking about where realistically the money might come from, which is why I said earlier that the money must come from somewhere. When we did MIS 1, we looked at demography, and we looked at the current, at the point, the CPF system, and our conclusion was very clear. The CPF didn't do enough for retirement, and the policy stance has, very, has been very much, well, count on your children. But if we look at demography, then as researchers, we must point out that it doesn't add up, right? Because older people are going to have fewer children. So, so that's what, as researchers, we can do. We lay out the various options, and then we hope there'll be public discussion about this. In MS2, the options are this, right? So first of all, we, we point out the cost of those public services, which currently fall quite heavily on individuals, right? Compared to, to in, in, in other places, for example. So, so it falls quite heavily on individuals. Um, if we wanted to change this, one way is of course, increase uh, state intervention across all the public services, childcare, housing, education, especially housing, because that's huge, right? But if we say we no, we can't touch that uh, for ideological or other reasons, then we must turn to wages. Right? And there we say that if we want to focus on wages, also PWM is not enough. Right? But what we mustn't do is to say that we can't move on any of these fronts. Because if you don't move on the wages front and you don't move on the public policy front, then people will have not enough. Right? That is what as researchers we can point out.
Thanks so much, Kako. Um, and now that just because we don't have that much time, I'm going to move on to the, the next question that's uh, very popular within the, the, the Q&A box, which has to do with debt servicing and the heavy burden that debt um, uh, is for many, many low income groups. And so the question from Paul Tambia is, did that come up in the focus groups at all? And, and perhaps you could speak a little bit to the kinds of variations in particular identity groups that could have um, impacts on um, uh, the, the, the kind of cost burdens on different families beyond the ones that you have already highlighted in your presentation. So there's also a question about how costs might vary by ethnic group. Um, so maybe you could speak to that as well. Maybe I can talk a bit about the debt, huh? and then I think Yuyen can can talk about the diversity in our in our groups and and, and so on the social dimensions. Um, the the way the the MIS method works is that it, it looks at different life stages, right? And so for for children, for example, there are five different age groups, and then for adults, we say there are twenty six to fifty four, and then this joins up with our previous study, which looks at older adults fifty. Um, uh, 55 to 64 and then 65 and above, right? Which means that at, at each life stage, we have calculated what people need. So if people at each life stage always had what they need, they wouldn't be carrying over any debt into the next life stage. So in a way, um, we always only look at current needs that, uh, that, that apply to that age group. In a way, people in each age category in the MIS, they, they have no past and no future. When they arrive at the next stage, again, we look at the needs at that stage. So they don't carry over neither savings nor debt. Uh, and, and that's how the method works. Uh, I'll, I'll let you then talk a bit about lower income persons and, and some of those issues. Oh, I was going to jump in on the ethnicity questions. OK, yeah. Um, so the, the definition itself that people came up with when we did the orientation groups, uh, actually participants themselves were extremely conscious about the fact that we live in a multicultural society, which means both sort of ethnically diverse as well as religiously diverse. And so there is specifically in the definition, uh, this, this part about the freedom to practice, you know, various cultural and religious uh, customs, right? And so when we talked about various parts of the budget, this came up as well. Food is a good example of this. So that when food came up and when we priced items, we made sure that we had halal options yeah, in, the, in the things that we selected uh, because we are mindful that some of those options can be more expensive, right? So that the budget needs to be able to enable everyone to have the choices yeah, that are and options that are available to them to meet the basic standards of living. So food was one area where we took that into account. Um, other places where that came up were in some of the clothing items, uh, such as track pants for, uh, you know, uh, girls between 13 and 18 for uh, physical education classes, uh, where uh, girls would girls in particular, uh, in, in uh, Muslim girls would, would require, right, modest clothing, right? So we, we also took that into account. Um, people also talked about the need for um, budgets to contribute to religious um, practices. So including children, like children should get into the habit of contributing somehow to the church or temple or, or whatever, or donations, yeah, secular as well. And, and that they should have this practice when, even, even as children, right, as a matter of habit and as a matter of learning to share with others. So again, I think various parts of the budget reflect you know, the fact that we live in a multicultural society. And that means that the budget needs to take into account that, that everyone should be able to exercise a certain level of choice in meeting their basic needs. Just quickly on the issue of debt uh, faced by uh, low income households, um, a critical uh, kind of pillar of the MIS method is that each focus group is economically diverse. Uh, that's really critical so that uh, the budgets, the items, and eventually the budgets they come up with are not uh, uh, 
uh, a budget for, for well-off people or budget for lower-income people. That's really important. Um, so so in, in that sense, we do not account for the special kind of uh, circumstances or lower-income households because this is a budget that applies universally for all Singaporeans. Right. Uh, this is related uh, tangentially to another question I saw in the chat about how we ensure we don't end up with kind of average budgets. Right. So we could equally ask, how do we know these are not extravagant budgets? The method has been has been engineered to to avert this. Right. So, for example, so I said that economic diversity in each focus group is important. The other strategy that's important is that for each item, we press them for justifications for why it's a need and not a want. Um, and all these are captured in our transcripts. Uh, and then, of course, when we ask them what price range before, so that we can go out to a shop to find out, we always begin with the question, is the cheapest okay? If they say no, why not? So we always, from spoons to toilet paper to towels, we always say, is the cheapest okay? If not, why not? Right. Um, and, and it took us, uh, we, we did put in a lot of effort to, uh, to pick up this method. Uh, the team traveled to the UK to observe our collaborators conduct their focus groups. And, and then our collaborators from Loughborough University also visited us several times, right? So, so we really wanted to get the method right. Thank you so much, Coco. I think that that's, that's really helpful to, to hear. And I think it addresses a lot of the questions that people have had in the chat about the methodology. Um, I'm going to shift the question a little bit to a slightly more philosophical question. Um, some of the terms that keep coming up throughout your report and even through your presentation today are words like respect, security, belonging, and, and these seem to be central to your definition of a basic standard living and even a living wage. And um, could you say more about why these principles were so important to you and to the project um, mission, and why take this approach in your design of this project, as well as in your thinking about minimum income standards? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize again that this comes from ordinary people, you know, that, that the, the, the spirit of this project really is about trying to capture how ordinary people think about what a basic standard of living in a particular context, in a particular time and place. Right, should look like. And many of our participants were very articulate in saying, you know, the basic standard of living shouldn't just be breathing, you know, being alive, right? It's it's also about thriving and and, and having respect and, and security and belonging and all those things are important components of that. Um, the belonging component of it, I would say in the in this round more than the last round where we talked to older people, in this round where parents talked about children's needs, this came up actually even more. This sense that they are very conscious of their children's needs to belong. And what does that mean? It means being able to do things other children can do. And so, you know, childcare is, is childcare center costs. Yes, but also there needs to be some budget so that they can join their, their friends on outings, right? Um, children need to be able to um, buy birthday presents for their friends so that they can go to, you know, birthday celebrations for their friends. They can belong to the social groups, right? Um, even things like enrichment and tuition, Right, which, which, I mean, we were we were a little bit surprised. There was so little contentiousness that these are basic needs, yeah. And we really push parents to articulate why why that would be, right? And and a lot of it has to do with wanting children to feel like they're not behind. They're 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 able to keep up with others, right? That they're that they're able to. Um, be part of what other people are, are what other kids are, are doing. Yeah, this doesn't mean, you know, I think, I think parents, as Scott Ho mentioned, you know, the, the consensus group uh, kind of method is very important. You know, we, we have to ask them for rationales, we have to challenge them. And actually, parents often challenge each other too, right? Like, is that really basic? How can you say that is basic? That, that sort of thing, right? But and, and through that, you know, they arrive at a point that where, where they can agree that, yes, in fact, it is basic for children to have some budget for enrichment activities because CCAs these days are not really for enriching them, you know, in the sense that 
they may not get into the CCAs they're interested in because CCAs have become much more competitive, competition driven, things like that, right? So children should still be able to pursue their hobbies and interests outside of school, outside of academic work in some ways, and, and to do so in, in some, in, sometimes with friends and, and others. So the, the need to belong and the sensitivity to children's needs to belong was something that was very palpable. Thanks so much, Yuyan. Um, where, um, another question that has come up has to do with um, uh, an additional type of policy solution that hasn't been mentioned so far, um, but has been uh, increasingly popular in other parts of the world, which is a universal basic, basic income. Um, and so a question has been raised about the fact that as we are moving into a, an employment environment where there is more um, uh, gig jobs, basically, um, there might be periods of time when people have no jobs at all. Um, and so how does a universal basic income um, solution feature within your policy recommendations, if it features at all? I think this has to do with the, um, I saw also a related question, uh, flagging possible sh uh, price shocks, right? Housing, fuel, and so on. Um, uh, we we try our best to take into account um, trends, recent patterns. So for housing, for example, I showed uh, I showed you the trajectories. Um, but in terms of prices, we take uh, prices actual flat prices in the last uh, three years, right? So we take historical figures because figures for the future do not yet exist. Um, so that the the um, so uh, Kumar who asked that question is exactly right. Uh, that if there was a price shock. Uh, then even families, their budget would increase. Then even families who are just managing uh, would in fact fall below, right? And we have to experience uh, some, some sort of sacrifice. Uh, that, is, that, that is true, right? So in, in some sense, this is a conservative, is a conservative estimate that does not buffer for, for shock. Um, uh, the, the question about uh, gig work is a really critical one. I think it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, because it has been such a, it, has, it is a grow, growing sector, right? B precisely because of unemployment and so on during this period. And I think the, 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 the main takeaway from some of those discussions about gig work is that if work and wages are going to be so volatile, right, in the near term, I don't know how near term, mid term, and for a while yet, uh, are going to be volatile, then we really need to think seriously about the social safety net. Uh, just now I said that income mix is the question, uh, either A must provide or B must provide, but we certainly can't have neither of them providing because then you push people into a corner. But A and B are not equivalent things, right? When the state provides, it's exactly as a buffer against shock. We call it a safe, social safety net exactly for that reason. It must catch people, it must work as a net. Right, uh, And that's how it differs from the market solution because asking people to depend on wages for all their needs exposes them precisely to these kinds of risks that I think we are noticing will only become uh, greater, uh, not lesser, because of the pandemic. Thanks so much, Koko. Um, we are getting very close to the nine o'clock mark and um, I've been told that we have to be quite strict with our time. So I'm gonna, um, uh, I wanna end by, by asking a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds, which is what can we do with this new information and these new insights into the, the struggles and challenges of certain segments of Singapore society? What can we do as individuals to help? What can organizations do? And so I'd like both of our authors to share with us what you would like to see happen next. Um, uh, how you would like individual members of the public, NGOs, others, the state to engage with this project and also with its insights. I will give my time to Koho. Koho, only four minutes, quick. <laughs> Represent. Uh, you, you, you beat me to it, I was going to say. <laughs> uh, um, but I, uh, I think, yes, we, we think a lot about application because this sort of research is never done only for for, for technical, uh, theoretical, academic reasons, right? We want it to do something. Uh, what do we want it to do? Uh, we, of course, hope that policymakers will take it into serious consideration as they're thinking about policies, right? Uh, we offer this as a benchmark uh, to, 
to to help with policy thinking, that is what it is for, right? And that is the point of the whole series of comparisons, right? It is to aid thinking. It's a thinking tool. Uh, so we do hope and and we always welcome uh, dialogue with policymakers if they're interested to 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 get deeper into these findings. That is the first hope. Um, at the within the community, we have already received since MIS one inquiries from NGOs and social work organizations because they often lack tools to assess which families are so called falling below, right? Uh, currently, they rely on government kind of financial assistance benchmarks. Uh, but I am sure the audience noticed just in the last series of slides I show you those benchmarks are, are all over the place. Right. The income limits are, are different across schemes. Uh, it's not always obvious how they are derived. So social work organizations often don't know which benchmark to use. And if, even if they chose one, they don't know why they chose it. Right. So we now have a, a transparent and, and, and rigorously established and calculated benchmark for social work organizations to use. We welcome them to use it. If they, are, they, have, if they have questions about adapting the, the results to various policies and programs and their services, please do approach us. Uh, our UK collaborators uh, have seen their work being extensively used by NGOs and, and we are very envious, right? So if NGOs are interested to use these findings, please come to us. We're very happy to chat. Uh, the, the, the question about for, for all of us as citizens, right? Where, where does this study put us? Um, this study has always been for us uh, especially meaningful, right? So we, it's a huge team that collaborate on this and on the side, we do our own things, right? But we come together for this study. It's meaningful uh, for a couple of reasons. We think the empirical finding, the figures are important, right? Because of the reasons I just mentioned, it feeds into policy and service planning, but also conceptually, right? The idea that uh, people can agree what basic need in our society today means. People who come from very different backgrounds can agree that there is such a thing called basic need. They can agree what it means. They can agree what it looks like, right? Uh, that ordinary citizens can do this is to us a very powerful thing to have witnessed and to have experienced ourselves, right? You didn't flag this. When we did MIS-1, we, we were slightly nervous whether people who had so-called the language to talk about what basic standard of living means. And some of the participants in the first round were, were older people. They did have the language, right? And they could justify it. They related it to their lives. They talked about worries about other members of society. They were extremely articulate, right? All our anxieties turned out to be unfounded. So this idea that people know intuitively that there's, a, there's such a thing called basic need, they can define it and they, they can agree over it. Uh, I think it's a powerful realization uh, and beyond the context of this study, I think it should urge all of us to think about how uh, in policy making and all sorts of kind of public deliberation and thinking, we should bring people into it, right? And, and not assume that answers are best produced uh, by narrow groups of elites. Thank you so much, Koko and Yu Yan. Um, we have now reached the end of our evening's program and I'd like to both congratulate and thank our authors for leading this study and for sharing their report's findings with all of us this evening. Um, I, I really want to emphasize the point that Coco um, just ended with so uh, in such an articulate manner. This work really fully, re fully, fully lives up to the potential of a public oriented social sciences in Singapore that's grounded in the needs and concerns of Singapore society and gives voice to those who may otherwise be voiceless and invisible in really important decisions about the future of Singapore. So thank you to all of the other members of the research team whom we didn't get to hear from today, and also to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for organizing this event. Thank you to all of the audience members for your wonderful questions. I realize that we only managed to address a, a tiny sliver of them, but I, I understand that Kotko and Yu Yen will be uh, both making themselves available and be going on a little bit of a road show, I think, in the coming weeks and months, where hopefully they will be able to meet you and answer your questions um, in those events. There is a feedback survey that you can fill in via the link in the chat box, and there's also going to be a QR code in the holding slide. Um, uh, but that is it for tonight. Thank you and good night.
could I could I just say since Anju thanked everybody, but none of us thanked Anju. That thank you so much, Anju, for moderating so brilliantly and bringing the questions together. And thank you everyone who's attended and for these wonderful questions. I've just been recording them, and we will look over them more carefully. And our eighty-page report will be on our website shortly. Uh, it's wonderful, if I may say so myself. <laughs> um, I. It's it's it's. Um, I think we 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 really benefited so much from all the people who participated in the study, and there is so much collective wisdom from people that's in this study that I hope many people will will read our report uh, and and see for themselves what we found. Thank you.